a reminder to all, but with a reminder to all of you, whatever festivities you are indulging, whatever festivities let let me enjoy. Let us try to be as safe as possible so that our smiles on the face remain your before as it is before the pujas through to the pujas and thereafter also and we pray to god also for giving us this protection and giving us our sense of responsibility so that we all, all of us can uh, behave responsibly now with this may i thank uh, lake town synergy and biocon for organizing this semi and giving me a free hand to choose the topics including the one for myself, and this I have deliberately chosen to celebrate the centenary of insulin. So without much further ado, let me attempt share, sharing my screen. And you know, once that is done, I will straight away go to my talk. So uh, yeah, allow me to share the screen. Yes, sir, you can share. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It is visible, I am audible. So there I go, right? So good evening once again. This evening, I will be di discussing about 100 years of insulin therapy, the lessons we have learned, what lessons actually insulin have taught us. Now, what do we mean by we? Actually, insulin has lessons enough for all, including not only the doctors, but the patients, researchers, medical historians, the Nobel Committee, teachers, students, the pharmaceutical industry, so on and so forth. Now, what are the lessons that can be taken from? I think this is too vast. In this short span of one hour, also, I would be dealing mostly with the discovery and recognition and touching upon the others very briefly. So insulin is the oldest anti-diabetic drug of modern medicine, and it is the oldest continuously prescribed medicine for diabetes. It is the oldest continuously prescribed medicine. It has the most predictable and efficacious results. Insulin is appropriate for all patients of diabetes at all times, irrespective of the type of diabetes, though we may not be using every time, but it is appropriate for all patients and at all times. Insulin has many firsts to its credit, and insulin has fetched Nobel Prizes on five, five occasions. Actually, insulin has been the first hormone to be used systematically in, as a replacement therapy, is the first hormone whose primary structure was found out, is the first hormone whose three-dimensional structure was elucidated, also the first hormone which was measured. So the Nobel Prizes, I will be dealing most with the 1923 Physiology of Medicine Nobel Prize that was awarded to Banting and MacLeod. Then Frederick Sanger actually got the Nobel Prize for elucidating the primary structure of insulin. Dorothy Crockwood Hodgkin received the Nobel Prize for the X-ray crystallographic structure. Rosalie Nielo and Salman Burson actually developed the radio immunoassay for insulin, thereby transforming a hitherto qualitative or semi-quantitative discipline of endocrinology to a qualitative one that which we are now familiar with. And Frederick Sanger 
once again uh, received the Nobel Prize. He received it twice. Now coming to the lessons that can be drawn from discovery, let me deal with a person whom we do not mention too much so far as insulin is co con concerned, that is Nikoli Konstantin Polescu. Nikoli Konstantin Polescu can be com considered as the Shubhash Mukherjee of insulin or the Subhash Chandra Bose of insulin. Nikoli Polescu was a professional physiologist at Bucharest, Bucharest of international repute. His interest in diabetes research started way back in 1891. You can well appreciate much before the Toronto uh, researchers. And he further researched it in 1920, 21. Though he was not much focused, shifting his attention in the interim to pituitary, his papers reflected a beautifully conceived and executed series of experiments. Polisco was never formally nominated, so the Nobel Committee could not consider him because you must know the Nobel Prize can only be awarded to persons who are nominated and one Nobel Prize at a point of time can be awarded to a maximum of three persons, three individuals or three, three societies. When he wrote to the Nobel Committee registering his protest and his claim to priority of insulin discovery, the committee sent him a booklet entitled the 1923 Nobel Prize. So they simply dismissed his claim. There's no doubt that he actually did discover insulin, but his success was annulled as he did not continue with his experiments. His publication appeared five months prior to those of Banting and Best, had a higher scientific characteristics compared to those of inexperienced Banting and Best, the publication which Banting and Best sent first in the Canadian Medical Journal and then the Journal of uh, Clinical and Laboratory Medicine had around 17 to 18 errors. These were overlooked, but they were accepted. But it has been said that had it been today, 100 years since, as hence, that article in that form wouldn't have been accepted and sent to the uh, authors for revision. But what did Paulus do lack? He did not have the industrial methods and was unable to compete with the Canadians in speed. Now, the Canadian authors erroneously interpreted Paulus's findings while translating from French thus transforming a positive finding into an exactly opposite one. I'll come to this in details later. Polisco subsequently got involved with the Romanian Christian Nationalist Party. He dabbled into politics, which had long, strong anti-Semitic and anti-Masonic characters. Finally, after the Second World War, Romania was taken over by the communist bloc and communists considered Polisco a fervent Catholic and a member of the Romanian right, an enemy of the party, and therefore they wiped out any trace of his achievements from the history of Romanian science. So, so to summarize who or what let Polisco down, first, I think Nikolai Poliski himself, despite being first, more methodical, more scientific and more organized, he lacked perseverance and did not go on to conduct human studies. Second is the issue of nomination. The Nobel Committee could not do anything based on the claim of Poliski himself and other subsequent researchers because the Nobel Prize can only be awarded to those 
who have been nominated. Second, a prize already announced is immutable. Next, Banting and Best. The wrong translation from French and opposite interpretation of policy's findings by the Toronto team. Next may be the industrial support. The Toronto team sought the help of Connaught Laboratories for production in Toronto and subsequently Eli Lilly of Indianapolis for the North American market. Then of course, the anti-Semitic sentiments of Nikolai Polisko, and finally, the communist takeover of Romania. Now let's discuss a little bit of Banting's misinterpretation of Polisko's findings. Was Banting's falsification really an inadvertent one out of ignorance of French or a deliberate one? Uh, we do not know, but Bart in 1976 had commented that Maclear being very well versed in literature may have discovered the falsification and might have threatened Banting with public expose unless he shared the glory and credit with Maclear. Therefore, here there is a conspiracy therapy of scientific blackmail, which was done. Of course, it cannot be proved, but it has been suggested that this was uh, perpetrated by the uh, MacLeod to ensure that he gets the Nobel Prize. And not only he gets the Nobel Prize, he gets the credit out of discovery. Now, let me actually try to play this. Actually, this, this is the important sentence which was misinterpreted by Bant Banting and Best. Best almost certainly, though this is the actually opinion of Michael Bliss, the historian, uh, the most famous historian of this Toronto insulin discovery. Best almost certainly mistook the phrase no plu, meaning not only, for he wrote no bon, meaning no good. Right, can I stop it and pass on to the next slide? Yeah. So let's now come to John James Rickard Macleod. He was the professor of physiology, Toronto General Hospital. Though convinced that Frederick Grant Banting's research would go up in smoke, he gave Banting a small disused dirty room in his department. And in the November 21 meeting of the Physiological Journal Club, incidentally, which was also the birthday, uh, 29th or 30th birthday of Frederick Banting, MacLeod said whatever Banting had to in his prolonged introduction and used the pronoun be throughout. Banting had no advanced degree, no honors, no publication, no experience in research or treating, or no private practice. Banting was inexperienced as a speaker, nervous, and not very articulate, and was stunned that day by MacLeod's unexpected introduction. introduction. Next comes the incident of August Krog. Shaq Augustinberg Krog, 
who was actually the professor of zoophysiology at the University of Copenhagen, the then most recent winner of Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. He visited Toronto at the instance of his wife, physician Dr. Marie Kroll, who had recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and she egged on to uh, Professor August Krog to infer about the possibility of insulin uh, for her. Actually, August Krog tried to come to Toronto earlier, but had to postpone because of indisposition of their son. And finally, he made it. And when he arrived in Toronto in November 1921, MacLeod hosted him in his house. And not only that, he arranged for a guest lecture for him too. MacLeod informed August Krog that Banting and Best would have gone off to the wrong track without his advice and guidance. Krog went back and nominated Banting and MacLeod for the Nobel. And in his nomination, Krog observed, and I quote, according to the information I personally obtained in Toronto, the credit unquestionably goes to Dr. Banting, but he would have sure, he would surely never been able to carry out the experiments on his own, which from the beginning and at all stages were directed by Professor MacLeod. Mind it, what was the basis of Dr. Krog's information and opinion? It was a hearsay evidence or a hearsay information. I also mind it, MacLeod was in Scotland for the greater part of June to September 1920, when Banting and Bext undertook the preliminary research. And there was just a couple of uh, letter correspondence between them, between Scotland and Canada, nothing more than that. And it is very unusual for the Nobel Prizes to be awarded within two years of discovery and that to people nominated for the first time. Now let's compare MacLeod with Banton. MacLeod was gentle, honest, a dedicated scientist, probably a little vain, urban, sophisticated, cultured, shy and reserved and cultivated. On the other hand, Banting was a shy, unsophisticated, the ordinary country boy who hated speeches, banquets, reporters, and formal dress, and hated being interviewed to the point of being rude to the reporters. Now, when after they had got the Nobel Prize, the team was invited by the, by the then Canadian Prime Minister. Banting went to that party with a black tux tuxedo and a blue pant, simply because he had forgotten to bring a matching black pant from Toronto. The, the meeting was in Ottawa. The, it was Ottawa was the capital from then. So he had forgotten to actually bring a matching pant from uh, Toronto and could not hired one because all were consumed, all were already hired for that meeting only. Fortunately, this was not uh, noticed by the, by the then Canadian prime minister, but was noticed by MacLeod. Now we can go back to November 14, 1921. Once again, the Physiological Journal Club meeting MacLeod made a long and eloquent introduction for the subject of their research. He often used we and did not leave much room for banting. His nervousness and lack of experience made banting lose the battle of impressions. Now, this is the learning that we all take from insulin. So if you have to, in whatever field you are in, be in politics, be in sports, be in films, be in medicine, be in any any walk of life, 
it is very important that you build your impression and many things are being done on impressions alone. So cultivating one's impression for us doctors, for us teachers, for our students in our field is equally important. Now comes to the Christmas meeting of the American Association of Physiology at Yale University, New Haven. Now in this meeting actually, Banting, the meeting was, the topic was registered in the name of Professor MacLeod because he was a member of the American Association of Physiology when others are not, but all of them did accompany uh, Professor MacLeod to the New Heaven meeting. In that meeting, as I said, actually, Fred Banting did not learn from the mistakes of 14 November. He did not do his homework. And so Elliot P. Jostin was present in that meeting. He said, Banting spoke haltingly, Mac cleared beautifully. So my advice to my students is that you, if you have to shine, you have to not to develop a gift of the gap, but you should train yourself to be a speaker. Banting got an indication, but he did not take hint out of it. Here also, MacLeod stole the show with his academic experience. Banting was very nervous and his presentation poor, and MacLeod came to his rescue. Now there are two sides of the story. Fred Banting thought that MacLeod stole the show, and MacLeod and his friends and supporters interpreted that he had saved the day for the Toronto team with his rescue, with his uh, intelligent and deft answers to the critical questions posed by, you know, who's who of uh, medicine at that point of time, including uh, the fatherly Dr. Frederick Allen. So MacLeod responded fluently to the question, and though not involved in the experiments, as I said, MacLeod was in Scotland for the major part of the time. He constantly used the pronoun us, and from then Banting became suspicious. And on their way back from New Heaven to Toronto, they were actually not on talking terms. And the meeting was attended by the representative of the research department of Eli Lilly of Company of Indianapolis. Next, we concentrate on the 3rd May 1922 meeting, because this probably is the most important meeting. It was a meeting of the Association of American Physicians that was held in Washington, DC. Here, the Toronto group, speaking through MacLeod, actually announced to the medical world their discovery of insulin. Why were Banting and Best not present here? Because they didn't attend the meeting, citing the reason that they couldn't afford the travel from Toronto to Washington, DC. Now coming to the initial publications in March, 1922, they published their first paper in the Canadian Medical Journal, which had the name of Banting, Best and Collip, but MacLeod's name was not there in that paper. And the second paper was in the Journal of Laboratory and Clinical Medicine, which bore the name of Banting and Best. But there was much acrimony thereafter. And after that, it was decided to have the names of all the researchers in alphabetical order. Now, naming of the hormone insulin. Actually, in 1921, Banting and Best named the pancreatic extract insulin at the suggestion of Professor MacLeod, who suggested the name insulin being oblivious or being uh, didn't actually, he didn't know uh, that before him, Jean de la Mer and Edward Albert Sharpe Schaeffer had actually named the salmon insulin with an E there. Now we come to the controversial 
Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 1923. In October 1923, the decision to award Nobel Prize to Bantik and Bakhtiad was announced for the discovery of insulin. And one of the nominations, as I said, was from the Nobel laureate August Krog, who visited Toronto and was hosted in the home by MacLeod from November 23 to 25. Of course, immediately after hearing this, Fred Banting decided not to accept the award since it was not awarded to best, but he was coaxed upon to relent and accept the award because he was the first Canadian to be receiving the award and it was a matter of prestige for Canada and also for the medical fraternity of the Toronto General Hospital. And as you know, uh, Banting shared his prize money with Best and just as a one-up man ship when MacLeod, on returning from Scotland, got to know that Banting has shared it with Best. He also telegraphed Colip at Alberta that he would be sharing his prize money with Colip, which Colip readily accepted. Now, coming back to the Nobel nomination, George Washington Crile, one of the persons who had indeed nominated Banting uh, for the award, the professor of surgery. Cleveland, Ohio, of course, wanted to wait a while before the decision being taken. Neither Banting nor Vaclier were present at the ceremony at Stockholm on 10 December 1923. It was received by the British ambassador. At that point of time, there was no virtual award giving ceremony, like I think December 10. 2021, it would be a virtual award giving ceremony from Stockholm, so far as Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine is concerned. So what's the, what's the contribution of J.J.R. MacLeod? According to Krog, Banting was unexperienced and supervised by MacLeod, Colib involved in production, not discovery. What was MacLeod's contribution? He provided laboratory facilities, dogs, medical student in Charles Harvard Best. Actually, there was a toss of a coin between Charlie Best and Clark Nobel, who would first uh, assist Banting. And Charles Best actually won the toss of the coin and he assisted, but for the first six weeks, but when it came the term of Clark Nobel, it was decided not to swap because then Banting would have to uh, teach everything to Clark Nobel, so best continued. Uh, another important contribution of MacLeod is that he included Colin in the team and probably the most important uh, attribute of MacLeod was that he was a knowledgeable person he was knowledgeable in literature and he was an eloquent speaker. So I think with these qualities, actually MacLeod backed the Nobel Prize. Whether these are the qualities that should fetch you a Nobel Prize or not is open to your discretion, open to your judgment. MacLeod at some point of time, while interacting with the journalists, said that he played the role of an impresario, the managing director, and indeed he played the role very well. Rolf Luft, an internationally acclaimed endocrinologist, observed that in Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 1923, there was the worst error of commission. Insulin was detected by Bantig and Best, while MacLeod, chair of the department, was not directly involved in the discovery. According to him, the prize should have gone to Banting, Best, and Polisco. 
What were the other claimants of discovery? I think Job Ludwig Zuelzar from Germany. He developed the pancreatic extract, who, what he called acometron. He claimed publicly as the discoverer of insulin. Oscar Minkowski and Joseph von Mering did not claim discovery, though they discovered the role of pancreas in diabetes by doing pancreatectomy, much the same thing which Banting and Best did at Toronto. Israel Simon Kleiner demonstrated the pancreatic extract to cause hypoglycemia, much like Bantic and Best, but he didn't claim discovery. Ernest Lyman Scott tried to isolate the pancreatic extract. He did briefly claim priority to discovery, but subsequently acknowledged Banting and MacLeod as the logical recipients of the Nobel Prize. And Nikoli Konstantin Polisko of Bucharest did develop pancreine, the pancreatic extract. He, he claimed priority to the Nobel Committee with documentary evidence, but his claim, as I had mentioned, was summarily discovered. So was really insulin discovery of fairy tale one. So I think the media has portrayed it like that. The wounded veteran, the failing about Banting, I mean to say, the wounded veteran, the failing small city doctor, the great idea late night, that is 2 a.m. on 31st October, 1920, Nothing but discouragement from the establishment. At one point of time, Banting wanted some salary, more jobs and more laboratory space to uh, MacLeod. He denied and he said, so far as the, you are concerned, I'm the University of Toronto. Then Banting said, okay, if you don't give this by tomorrow morning, I would be going away to some other institute like the Rock Fennel Foundation. Then MacLeod commented, you want to go to the Rock Fennel Foundation, but they are winding up the diabetes clinic, diabetes department under Frederick Allen. Will they support you? But eventually MacLeod did relent and he was, he provided him with the necessary experimental animals and space and also arrange for some sort of remuneration. Only a young student helper, grinding poverty, disturbed romantic life. He, at that point of time, he was really having a very bad romantic relationship with Eddie Roa, his girlfriend, who actually was very cut up, very annoyed that he has left his practice in London and is doing research, dabbling into research without any money. And she also actually had returned the engagement ring, which actually Banting used to wear it in his uh, chain of the watch. Finally, of course, they broke up when he received the Nobel Prize. It was now Edith Roark's turn to approach him uh, for marriage. But at that point of time, Banting declined. Imaginative experiments under the worst conditions with primitive equipment, and then the brilliant, spectacular success. But in reality, it was nothing that, of that sort, as has been portrayed by the media and also in certain literature. It was indeed a team effort. Banting developed the research idea, and in collaboration with Banting, uh, collaboration with BEST made most of the experiments and surgeries. BEST collaborated with Banting, mind it. BEST, who started as a student assistant, became a collaborator, not only an assistant, a collaborator of Fred Banting, a comrade in arms, standing with him through thick and thin through the phase of discovery of insulin. MacLeod provided the laboratory and scientific guidance through all research steps. He had an active role 
in the final steps of isolating and purifying insulin, not only through his suggestions, but his very important suggestion of uh, involving James Bartram Colley, the boyish looking young 29 year old professor of biochemistry of the University of uh, Alberta, who was visiting on a rock pillar uh, foundation uh, fellowship on a sabbatical in Toronto. So Fred Banting had the idea, MacLeod helped with logistics and guidance, whether that justifies for a Nobel, may be open to debate though. Fred Banting, aided indispensably by Charlie Best, provided the determination that was lacking in the previous workers, notably Paul Esco. This is the message. Banting, the novice, believed he possessed unshakable, unscientific faith. MacLeod and Frederick Allen had the doubts of the wise man. James Bertram Collip actually purified the pancreatic extract suitable for effective human use. But after initial breakthrough, in the months of April, May, June, Collip could not produce insulin in the laboratory after the initial breakthrough in January 1922. There it was uh, propagated into media. There were demands of insulin to the entire team. Collip failed. And there was much stress on banting. And he said he had once commented in the month, month of March, he never, I never went to bed one day sober. So he to actually ward off the depression, he took into heavy drinking and also smoking. Finally, they caught hold of industrial co cooperation, Connaught Laboratories initially, and then Eli Lilly and Company of Indian Pulse. So the book on the team was indeed very volatile, banting, shy, inarticulate, ordinary, insecure, thought that MacLeod was conspiring against him to usurp the credit of insulin discovery. Charles Best, on the other hand, was outgoing, sociable, popular, but was caught, caught in the banting MacLeod rivalry. MacLeod probably could have managed banding a bit better, but this is a message, this is a learning for teachers and would be teachers here, what Michael Bliss has commented. Only a superman could have led the untutored, insecure, bullheaded banding through to insulin without major troubles, unquote. And some students, and he also wants goes on to command, some students are simply impossible to deal with. Colip joined the team at MacLeod's request. Best didn't like the idea. After successfully purifying the pancreatic extract in January 1922, Colip refused to divulge the process to Banting and Best. Banting grabbed Colip by the overcoat, almost lifting him, Colip first fortunate enough not to get out. Banting in later years, though became close friend with Collip and came to River Duncan Graham. Grant and Graham was the head of the Department of Medicine at Toronto General Hospital, who initially had reservations of allowing Banting and Best, not being clinicians, to use what they call MacLeod serum to, to Leonard Thompson but later he revered Duncan Graham as a father substitute. His hatred for MacLeod, however, did not diminish, nor did MacLeod's dislike for Banting when, only that he refrained from discovering insulin discovery while being asked back at Aberdeen. He joined the Regius Professor in Aberdeen, Scotland. Now, such was the hatred. There are two incidences I, I, I tell you. When uh, MacLeod was leaving Toronto for Scotland, in his farewell dinner, 
not only did Banting didn't attend authorities to place a chair and keep it empty. And when uh, MacLeod was boarding the train at Toronto, he was rubbing his shoes. Somebody asked why he was doing that. He said that before leaving, I want to rub all this dirt of Toronto out. Best, who was a comrade in arms during difficult insulin discovery years, was started to be disliked by Banting, having to share power and influence in the Banting Institute, which both of them worked in the Banting and Best Institute in the Toronto General Hospital. Banting disliked Best's ambitions. Best could not respect Banting as a scientist. In subsequent lectures, whenever there, there was talk of scientific race research, Banting always talked of ideas, not of methods, but of ideas. So what are the lessons from Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 1923? There should be necessary of careful investigations of nominations to act upon multiple nominations only, to delay the time between the discovery and the time for awarding may serve its purpose, which is to award those who are true contributors. But then there were very few regulatory hurdles. The Toronto start team started work on internal secretion of pancreas in 1920. Leonard Thompson received the first injection on January 1, 11, 1922, which was a failure. Uh, the successful injection was given on January 23. From May 1922, Eli Lilly and company started commercial manufacture and the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine awarded in October 1923. So lightning fast development of events. So this first Nobel, Nobel Prize award, award could have waited, but the lightning first commercial use of insulin actually had saved many lives. But nowadays, just an example, by aspart insulin, by us, it was opened, research opened in 1991, and it hit the market in the European Union in 2020. So almost 10 years of a known molecule in NPH is known, aspart is known, but just to combine NPH and aspart and to make it available to the patients it took yeah. 12, uh, yeah. 10 years. So coming to the indications, initial years, there was skepticism about, the, about insulin. It was thought too potent for safe use. It was expensive and used as a last resort. But it removed the physiological, psychological stretch jacket of the rigid treatment of Frederick Allen's starvation diet. It remained the sole agent of controlling hyperglycemia, still sulfonylureas and biguanides were developed. Long acting analogs and the understanding of leukotoxicity encouraged earlier use of insulin in type two diabetes. Safety and efficacy of the DPP-4 inhibitors, metformin and certain sulfonylureas and meglitinides have rather shrunk the indications of insulin in CKT. Coming to the structure and analogs, discovery of insulin was not the end, but the beginning of improving upon existing therapy. There was a relentless purification and protraction researches. Thus we got PISA dye, lenti insulins, MPH, and the long acting and short acting and insulin analogs. This implies that insulin therapy is far from ideal or physiological and the knowledge that the primary structure of protein can be intelligently manipulated to reap pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic benefits rather safely. Now coming to the diabetic complications, insulin saved the dying children starting 1922 at Toronto of acute complications. And this is the picture of Leonard Thompson, who actually died at the age of 29 due to pneumonia. 
but survived type 1 diabetes. Another very uh, uh, prominent VIP patient to receive insulin in the first batch was Mrs. Elizabeth Hughes. In the 1930s to the 50s, the survivors of type 1 diabetes, thanks to insulin, developed blindness and renal failure. Thus, the understanding of chronic complications unfolded before the medical fraternity. In 1993, the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial actually showed that intensive glycemic control can prevent microangiopathic complications. And the EDIC study that gave us the concept of legacy effect or metabolic memory. Then education and empowerment. As insulin therapy became domiciliary from a hospital-based treatment in the initial years, hypoglycemia started to become a limiting factor to strict glycemic control. And the value of continued patient education surfaced. And here, I think Elliot P. Jocelyn had a much greater role to play than Frederick Banting or Charles Best, who actually headed the Banting and Best uh, Institute of Diabetes at the Toronto General Hospital. It was understood that insulin therapy cannot be successful without patient education, motivation, and self-monitoring of blood glucose. Then came the biosimilar insulin. This again, it's a controversial area. India is a large market for biosimilar insulins, but there were problems of the insulin of Marvel Life Sciences, but is a biocon partnership in the global distribution of biosimilar insulins produced by Biocon and distributed by Pfizer in the United States and European Union due to some concerns about the safety and efficacy raised from the Z. So that led to withdrawal of that biosimilar insulin from India and of another company's biosimilar insulin batches also had been withdrawn periodically, but otherwise biosimilar insulins are doing quite good. And I am told that uh, exchangeability between uh, Biocon's biosimilar insulin and glargine, that is Sanofi's glargine in the United States has been granted, that is they can be used interchangeably. Role of the pharmaceutical industry, actually insulin discovery showed as that any drug discovery cannot be without participation of the pharmaceutical industry. Nikole Polisku was a seasoned researcher having an organized research plan. The Toronto team had amateur researchers. Banting was only 29, not 22. Banting was only 29. That to a failed private practitioner and an amateur researcher at the time of discovery Best was 22 at the time of discovery. They worked with primitive equipments, produced insulin that was weak, contaminated, or ineffective, while Polisco resigned, stating that human experimentation would require a lot of money. The Toronto team, after many frustrating failures in the spring of 1922, tied up Eli Lilly. While in the beginning, was insulin is provided to the select Eli Lilly doctors, the insulin aristocrats. In 1923, GHA Cleus, minded the pronunciation is Cleus, boasted of Eli Lilly's capacity to produce insulin enough for the civilized world. Mark his, mark the word of the research director for the civilized world. World. They never bothered about the rest of the world. You just imagine, and they are now almost all but exiting from direct marketing in the Indian from the Indian market. Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk focused on insulin, and they are still in the field till death, maintaining global prominence. 
Novo Nordisk has the largest global market share of insulin to the tune of around 55%. Pfizer messed up with inhaled insulin as well as injectable insulin. The Pfizer Biocon tie up for providing biosimilar insulin to the world was a short lived honeymoon, like the honeymoon phase of type 1 diabetes. That, what that shows, that shows perseverance rather than chemically pace. Modes of delivery devices, we have a lot. Mind it, inhaled insulin has gone away with the wind. In injectables are the best. Among the injectables, we have syringes, pens, and pumps, but syringes are cheap, effective for almost all patients and at all times under the longest surviving mode of insulin injection. No matter how fancy or how patient friendly the pumps are, uh, are syringes are the longest surviving mode of insulin injections. There are, of course, controversial areas of mutagenicity, mitogenicity, carcinogenicity with glargin at one point of time that has been actually put to rest. I won't go into much details of it. Immunological insulin resistance, insulin allergy, and injection site lipoatrophy are the thing of the past now that we are using purified insulins, purified recombinant DNA human insulin. So the lesson is that purity pays. Insulin enigma, enigmas are the bit in diabetes, subcutaneous insulin resistance, insulin neuritis, temporary worsening of neuropathy, the Mauriac syndrome of over-insulinization, and Somogi Ivek may be a much ado of no, about nothing. Somogi himself has said the post-hyperglycemic hypoglycemia may be actually due to a pharmacologic inadequacy of basal insulin. Something doesn't exist. So I conclude, therefore, by summarizing what we have really learned from the insulin and its discovery. For prominence, fame, and recognition, street smartness and publications are necessary, as has been shown by the street smartness of the cool street smartness of Professor MacLeod and publications of the Toronto team, however, however faulty they are, vis-a-vis -vis Nicolai Polesco. Drug discovery and commercial availability are not possible without the support and co co cooperation of the pharmaceutical industry, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk. Regulatory checks on new drug development and the launch are mandatory and welcome, but too much of it may be constricting. Had there been regulatory norms in 1921 that we are used to see these days, many patients would have died or led a miserable life before death would have emancipated them. Insulin has unmasked the chronic degenerative complications of diabetes. Glycemic control with insulin have proved that effective control can prevent chronic degenerative complications. Insulin is one of the anti-diabetic drugs that has stood the state of test of time and would be used in some form or the other to treat patients of diabetes so long as diabetes exists. Genetic engineering and relentless research in the field of protein chemistry have refined insulin therapy over the years, making it much safer, much patient friendly, and much acceptable. Attempts at alternate non-invasive routes of delivering insulin have failed miserably. Even the pump is restricted in its usage. As an agent for chronic use, insulin has proved to be safe on all counts, many of the first batch of patients who received insulin at the Toronto General Hospital outlived all, the, all its four discoveries. So the ultimate teaching is that perseverance space, perceptions matter. So I conclude with this excerpt from Michael Gleese that he wrote in 1990, Ins and I quote, insulin was given to the world 
as a result of messy, confused experimentation on living subjects, unthinkable today. It was the mysterious magical secretion of the pancreas that researchers finally learned how to extract from animal pancreas, removed at the abattoir immediately after slaughter in forms suitable for administration to humans. By the late 1950s, chemists understood the exact structure of insulin molecule in the context of a dazzling explosion in our knowledge of DNA and the process of life itself. Within another 20 years, what had once seemed a wild science fiction dream, the idea of manipulating genes to create life forms in the laboratory was now a practical possibility. The great scientific revolution of our time, the advent of molecular biology, made it possible to conceive of genetic engineering techniques that could lead to the biosynthesis of real human insulin. The era of animal insulins, as they had become life-saving, creatively compounded and beautifully purified, drifted towards its end. Unquote. So this is actually the flame of foam, which is lighted in front of uh, Banting's house, which is converted into a Banting memorial at London, Ontario. It was lighted in 1989 by Queen Elizabeth, the head of state of Canada. And this flame will be extinguished only when a cure of type 1 diabetes would be available. With this, I stop and I thank you for giving me, tolerating me for about an hour. And if there are any questions, I would love to take them. I think there are no questions on chat box, uh, the organizers. So I think we can pass on to the next event, should we? Indranil Ban. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, what is the next agenda? We have the, I think Dr. Anirban Sina, who is the assistant professor of endocrinology at Medical College Kolkata. He will be talking about management of diabetes uh, in primary care and resource constraint settings. Who can be more appropriate than a person other than Dr. Anir Bansida, who is a medical teacher in the medical education service, working in medical college, and what cannot be a more appropriate time than of this topic than this, because recently the state protocol for management of diabetes has been published. And I'm proud to say that I am one of the participants in developing that protocol. Over to Dr. Anil Bansina, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjinder, for your nice introduction. Today, the, the topic is uh, the state protocol is not honestly included in my talk. So what I will discuss is the understanding of the uh, glycemic variability in the Indian perspective because we take a higher amount of carbohydrate diets and those things which can affect our diet uh, dietary pattern and the glycemic variability more than the standardized protocol. So I will highlight on that part only because it has a very broad perspective of managing diabetes in Indian protocol. So I will highlight that part only to cut short my lecture and I can answer the questions if anyone asks for it. So to start with, uh, so this is uh, my talk today that management of diabetes uh, with a range of uh, glycemic variability concern is the uh, talk of the day today because we understand now that 
H1C and the fasting postprandial control is not the only thing, and that is same for our Indian population. So, until that, fasting postprandial H1C was considered a treatment parameter for anti-diabetic agents, but it is not enough to achieve the tight glycemic goal because we understand the same patient of H1C of seven. There is a huge glycemic fluctuation compared to the H1C of seven with a steady glycemic control with a time in range of more than seventy percent. So glycemic variability is considered as a fluctuation of glucose level over time within the same day or between the days of the same time points. And time in range is the percentile of the time spent in the target glucose in seventy to one eighty milligram per deciliter. And glycemic variability is a important factor and the adverse clinical outcomes and how to improve it there are many issues because it represents the short term or within the variability long term or inter, inter day variability even the inter, within the month variability because there are issues like uh, dietary pattern there are issues like exercise even there are issues like even the like the puja or any other festivals coming the glycemic variability changes a lot and these things should be kept in mind when we treat the patient of diabetes And there are limitations, as we understand, with the HPLC and growing evidence of glycemic variability was significant. And there's drawn the attention of adverse clinical outcomes, including the diabetic macrovascular and microvascular complications of this patient. So not only that uh, it causes the hypo and hyperglycemia, but also increases the complication of the diabetic patients. So glycemic variability and microvascular complication, it is estimated by MAGE which might be independent risk factor for diabetic neuropathy in the patients of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. More importantly, the National uh, Diabetes Care Management Program, the long-term variability of fasting glucose was considered as one of the potent predictor for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And similarly, h one variability was independently associated with severity of cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy and glycemic variability involves the Long-term visit-to-visit H1C variability independently associated with risk of retinopathy and nephropathy. So both H1C as well as glycemic variability itself can in predict the peripheral neuropathy as well as nephropathy and retinopathy as well. So the complication is huge. And hypoglycemia is the major independent therapy to the diabetes, where H1C widely used as a measure for mean glycemia. And glycemic variability is the important target for hypoglycemia prevention and management in diabetic patients treated with insulin. So this glycemic variability and mortality also has an important association. A number of the studies verified that glycemic variability was not only associated with the risk of related complications and hypoglycemia, but also simultaneously related to the incidence of mortality. So this again shows the importance of the glycemic variability in these patients. So there are means to look for uh, like the we can go for CGM, which classically uh, detects the glycemic variability, continuous glucose monitoring, which de detects the glycemic variability and helps us to reduce the, the glycemic variability as well as hypoglycemia. Insulin analogs, uh, like long acting analogs like Deglutec and others, where uh, longer acting duration of insulin have a lesser glycemic variability, so is uh, any glyphosines which improves the glycemic variability, so is the SCD2 inhibitors. They have also shown studies in different uh, that glycemic variability is less. And regarding diet and exercise, low carbohydrate diet, as we commonly do not take, even Indian diet is huge carbohydrate, so if we can cut down our dietary carbohydrate in Indian perspective, so we can also reduce the glycemic variability in these patients. So we can go for low glycemic index food. We can also reduce the glycemic excursions or can be reduced by uh, food orders or you can take the fatty meals uh, maybe in the first so that it deters the absorption. So it fluctuation and peaks of the glycemia is less. Exercise in the first, uh, fasted and uh, postprandial state after breakfast do not, uh, not to be done in the fasting state. Decrease the glucose uh, excursion and aerobic and eccentric exercises also reduce the incidence indices of glycemic variability. So these are the non-pharmacological measures to reduce the glycemic variability in these patients. Dietary intervention in the Indian perspective is very important. We should go for a low carbohydrate, high fat breakfast, uh, which is uh, sometimes difficult for understanding, but if you the we can get this time 
and sufficient to reduce the postprandial hyperglycemia and improve the glycemic excursion. Low glycemic index foods can minimize the blood glucose fluctuation and lower glycemic index foods also able to actually reduce the glycemic variability and promote the fat oxidation. An effective dietary intervention has been potential to achieve the food glucose probably by influence the glycemic variability. Now coming to the exercise, which are not uh, pharmacological measures, exercise training like the resistance exercise, aerobic exercise or combination of both has a very important role in the reducing the glycemic variability or oxidative stress. Inspiratory muscle training uh, decreases the glucose levels and glycemic variability in the patients of type diabetes in the different studies. And frequent interruption of prolonged sitting with the three minutes uh, light intensity walking uh, breaks or every 15 minutes improves the nighttime glycemic variability. So you can uh, practice this in a real life scenario in the long uh, sitting hours like the uh, IT professionals, we can advise these things. Similarly, two weeks of both high intensity interval training of, of, or moderate intensity continuous training were similarly effective in lowering the glycemic variability as well as endothelial lightness. So if the patient can uh, do for moderate intensity uh, continuous exercise, we can go for high intensity interval well, training can equally be effective in these patients. So, I uh, this is the conclusion of glycemic variability that it has been identified closely associated with risk of adverse clinical outcomes and provides a better predictor for such complications. With the availability of uh, CGM in the clinical practice, uh, the assessment of glycemic variability becomes not only possible but also required. CGM was frequently superior to continuous subcutaneous glucose infusion and, uh, growth, um, uh, and could guide individual therapeutic changes to reduce the glycemic variability, hypoglycemia or CVD. Glycemic variability correlates with the oxidative stress and exocyte membrane stability, emphasizing a participation of pathogenesis of related complications. So, all this perspective, the glycemic variability is very important to control. So I might talk ends here. I understand because uh, uh, the slides provided and the discussion was not done properly with me. So the whole aspect of the Indian management of diabetes is, could not be done today with my small time of talk. So, but uh, we can answer the and discuss this in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Sina, uh, for your uh, quite crisp and brief talk. I have talked for one hour, so I think this uh, after my talk, the, your talk has been refreshingly short and succinct. Now, uh, may I ask you one question, since uh, we are dealing with this um, Indian perspective and resource constraint settings, uh, when it comes to basal insulin. Uh, Glargin, you know, is the, we all know, is the gold standard basal insulin. But in the yes. peripheral health institutions, if glargin is not available, how do you still believe uh, place MPH vis-a-vis glargin for basal insulin support? See, in my understanding, uh, the glargin has been available widely. The generic glargin has been available widely even in the peripheral health centers. Even uh, so, NPH, on the other hand, I find myself that it has been less commonly available as isolated NPH. As a premix no, analog, no, it is available. Actually, actually, you are you are actually going through what we are having in the medical colleges. But if you go go to the state protocol that we have suggested in the up to the say situations where subdivision below the subdivisional hospital in the primary health center, there won't be any insulin in the um, secondary health center or district hospital, if there is basal insulin, it will be uh, NPH only. Glargin would be kept very restricted, unlike in the medical colleges. That's what I am seeing. Yeah, I understand your point. But I, uh, as I've seen with my friends working in the periphery, uh, in the hospitals, uh, that maybe may not be the primary health centers, but other places, they prescribe more glargin than the NPH. And honestly, the availability of NPH is very limited in the periphery if you write, and if the patient cannot get it outside unless it is provided by the government. So this availability of NPH is a concern at present. Right. If you, the patient cannot get it from the hospital, if you write it, uh, I don't think the patient can get it randomly. Right. 
Yeah, it's not available in the market simply because the usage is less. Yeah. As a, At the as same a, time, as I a, understand, the urban healthcare and urban uh, urban health centers working under the corporation, so they they also provide the premix uh, insulins as well as sometimes glargine. So they also provide glargine. Though it is, I understand your statement is urban, but this is again a peripheral health center of the urban setup. But they also provide glargine and uh, premix in, uh, so uh, premix insulins NPH. And premix insulin as well as glargine. So these are available in the peripheral centers as well. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anubhan Sina. Now I think we have the third and the last session of today. That would be a very interesting debate. I think Dr. Indira Maistam is here. She is the consultant and endocrinologist heading the department actually in charge of the department of Endo Bading, department of endocrinology at uh, RG Corps Medical College. Um, Indira, over to you for conducting this exciting debate between Dr. Ipshita Ghosh and Dr. Shubrata Chakraborty. Thank you, sir. A very warm good evening to all present here. Uh, thank you, organizers for having this uh, program. Thank you, Professor Sengupta. It was a very excellent presentation. And thank you, Dr. Anirvan Sinha for setting the stage of what we are going to debate now. So it is on glycemic variability. The ma management of glycemic variability is important. In, it is an important tool in the proper management of diabetes today. So that is the motion of the house. And we have two very dynamic speaker, young speakers. Uh, the first who will be speaking for the motion is uh, Dr. Ipsita Ghosh. She is a senior resident in the Department of Endocrinology at um, IPGM ER. And uh, Dr. Uh, Shubrata Chakraborty, consultant and a senior uh, resident in the Department of Endocrinology at, uh, uh, sorry about it, uh, at uh, Diamond Harbor Medical College. So let's uh, start the debate. Uh, Dr. Ipshita Ghosh. Uh, please put on your mic. Ipshita, please put on your mic. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'll just uh, start my screen share. Uh, so thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's an honor to be in a part of a panel where Sir uh, Professor Shengupto, Sir is there, Dr. Sena is there, and ma'am is there. And uh, Shubroto is a very dear colleague of mine, and uh, sharing the same platform with him for this debate is a very big opportunity for me as well. Uh, so without much delay, I'll just uh, start the topic. Uh, I'm for the motion that glycemic variability management is essential today for proper management of diabetes. So uh, as Sir has set the um, stage, uh, Dr. Sinha Sir, uh, that glycemic variability is an important modern uh, glucometric, uh, the new one, uh, the glycemic variability and the TIR is the fourth and the fifth um, uh, 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 part of after fasting PP and HbA1c, the modern glucometric, which is essential for the management of diabetes nowadays. And why is it so? That is my first part of my uh, topic. And uh, how do we do that? And what are the advantages of that over HbA1c is my uh, conclusion. So... As we all know, diabetes is one of the uh, major chronic illness, chronic non-communicable disease, which is plaguing millions of people worldwide. Around 463 million uh, people worldwide is affected with diabetes, of which 77 million comes from India. And it's uh, said to be pro projected that 153 million by 2045, which is around 74% increase. And what we know is that around 1.6 million, to be exact, the death is directly attributed by, due to diabetes. So that is the most important factor, that death Majority is the cardiovascular death, and 1.6 million is directly attributed to diabetes. Now, my question is, can diabetes complication be controlled with HbA1c alone, or something else is required? Now, if you go through the trials that we have, the major trials, the court trial, uh, which, uh, constituted, uh, which was done over 10,000 uh, individuals, a study group, 
Half of it was on intensive therapy and the half on standard therapy. And the HB1C level in the intensive therapy was around 6.4 with the standard in around 7.4. And it was seen that with the intensive therapy, there was an increase in the mortality rate and there has not been any significant reduction in the major cardiovascular event as well. So why is it so with an intensive therapy? Why is the mortality rate increased? Now, even in the advanced, um, advanced trial as well, when you uh, go through the intensive and the standard therapy, there was no significant effect on the major cardiovascular events and death as well. We all know that the microvascular complications have, have an improved effect, but not the major cardiovascular uh, complications and death. Even the VADT trial, the Veterans Affair trial as well, they showed also there is no significant effect in the cardiovascular events. But there were around 12% decrease, um, non-significant decrease in the cardiovascular outcome, but it was not significant. So why is it so? Even as I mentioned that microvascular complication has a better outcome, even here in the VADT trial, it was seen that with standard as well as intensive therapy, there was no difference in the outcome in the microvascular complications. So 15 years follow-up as well, only with a uh, non-significant uh, decrease in the cardiovascular outcome around 12%, there, were, there weren't any other major in, improvement in the death outcome or any, uh, say, the primary outcome as well. So why is it so? Possibly because both low and high level of glycemic control were associated with an increased mortality risk and the le uh, level of variability also seems to be an important factor, suggesting that a stable glycemic level in the middle range is associated with a lower risk. So glycemic variability, as assessed by the variability over time in HB1C, might be an important factor in understanding the mortality risk in older individuals with diabetes. So what are the limitations of HB1C. It does not capture hypoglycemia. So even the people with diabetes whose HB1C level is less than 7%, they spend around more than 90 minutes a day with a glucose level of less than 70 milligram per deciliter. And the impact study also has shown that HB1C of 6.7, they spend around 200 minutes a day with a mean blood glucose level of less than 70 milligram per deciliter at baseline. Again, there has been seen, there has been some differences between the HbA1c levels amongst different groups, say pregnancy, anemia, hemoglobinopathies, iron deficiency, then CKD. Uh, again, ethnical racial issue uh, uh, variability is also there. And it does not capture glycemic variability. So glycemic variability has been shown to have an increased risk of hypoglycemia, cardiovascular outcome, and all-cause mortality. And HB1C does not capture glycemic variability. So if you go through this graph, both have similar HB1C, but one having a high glycemic variability with many high parts and high posts, and the other having a low hypo, uh, glycemic variability with no hyperglycemic and hyperglycemic episodes. So what do we want? Uh, what do we need? We need an HB1C just like the patient two, number two. So now. The world is changing and the, with the modern glucometrics, we have the TIR and the glycemic variability. So has TIR replaced HbA1c? This is what we need to know. So what do you know about the difference between the HbA1c and TIR? HbA1c evaluates a single HbA1c value, only one time value, compares every three, com comparison is done every three months. It does not capture hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic levels occurring on the same day. Immediate effect of therapy changes are not recordable, and there is a bad correlation with the patient reported outcome. High susceptibility to interference, as I've already mentioned, anemia, age, CKD, etc., and good correlation to clinical endpoints. Many long term studies are there. But if you compare that with an ATIR, it evaluates a continuous glucose level, compares it may, any time period, captures all glucose level for the given time frame immediately detects acute effect on therapy changes, good correlation with the patient reported outcomes, low susceptibility to interference, and correlation to endpoints are, is actually unclear. 
So there has been uh, there had there are many studies, but there are two studies, um, uh, two uh, meta analysis which was done over eighteen studies. One included only type one diabetic individuals, and the other both type one and type two. They showed a good correlation between the, between the HB one C and the percent TIR. So with every ten percent change in the TIR, there is a difference of 0.8, and the target TIR that we have set for ourselves is around 70 percent, which has an HB1C of 6.7 in one study group, and the other study group it's around 7 percent, which I'll tell, uh, talk about later on. So a 10-year cumulative. <clears throat> cumulative incidence of developing diabetes related complication after improving TIR, it has been shown that an improvement in both type 1 and type 2 with a TIR of 70% and 80%, especially with the complication of myocardial infarction, end stage renal uh, diseases, severe vision loss, and amputation. So, again, I am asking the same question Can diabetes complication be controlled with HbA1c alone? or we need glycemic variability in that. So if we reduce only the mean glucose level as shown by the graph A, the incidence of hypoglycemia is more. But if we change the mean glucose, lower the mean glucose level as well as the glycemic variability, the chances of having hypoglycemia is less. Now, if you talk about incidence of um, Incidence of hypoglycemia with a wide, uh, wide, wider fluctuation or a higher fluctuation in glucose levels, it's seen that the hypoglycemia levels, uh, hypoglycemia incidence is more with, uh, when the standard deviation is more than 30 milligram per deciliter or having a higher fluctuation of the glucose level. And it has been also seen that there is an increased apoptosis with an occasional high glucose levels or high spikes. But with a patient with a constant level of high blood sugar level or normal glucose level, the apoptosis is not that high. This observation was done with, uh, observation was seen on um, human um, umbilical vein endothelial cells with different concentration of glucose were done. And after seven to 14 days, there has been some amount of detachment, which was uh, stained and later analyzed. And we see that with the more fluctuation, there is more apoptosis. So why is it so? With increased spikes, there is increased oxidative stress endothelial damage and inflammatory reactions. Now, both the short-term and long-term glycemic variability will lead to glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity with an increased FFA, which leads to oxidative stress, epigenetic changes, endothelial dysfunction, and microangiopathy. So what we know is that incidence of micro and macrovascular complication increases with the fluctuation of fasting plasma glucose, as well as Sir had mentioned that with an increase in the um, fasting plasma glucose level or the uh, variability in the fasting pl plasma glucose level also, we have seen an increased incidence of neuropathy as well. And if you go about, um, talk about MACE or, sorry, MACE, uh, that is the um, uh, uh, mean arithmetic glycemic excursion, uh, with a higher MACE, elderly AMI patient had significant higher cardiac mortality and incidence of all MACE which was in one year follow-up group. And also there is lower survival rate in elderly patients with acute myocardial infarction when the age is significantly increased. And if you talk about the renal dysfunction as well, uh, there is a percentage change in the ACR, EGFR or, as well with an, uh, so renal dysfunction progresses faster with an increased fluctuation of blood glucose level. Again, the Alzheimer's disease as well, the risk of Alzheimer's disease also increases with the fluctuation of blood glucose level. Along with that, the SD and the MAGE increases with age. So we need to focus on these patients to reduce the glycemic variability as well. Now, if you go to this picture, it uh, has a um, thousand meanings. So a CGM, if you look at a graph of CGM, it has got a, a, one picture talks about thousand things at one time. So, which is not possible with an HbA1c or a single fasting or a PP level. So, HbA1c reflects an average level over three months and self-monitoring of blood glucose or the SMBG can or cannot detect an unexpected hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. So, what does the ADA guideline 2019 uh, declare? That CGM also has an important role in assessing the effectiveness and safety of treatment in subgroups of uh, patients with type 1 and selected patients with type 2. And who are those? 
those having hypoglycemic unawareness and those having frequent hypoglycemic episodes. So these patients, CGM is required 100%. So what are the key parameters that we look into? That is the mean blood glucose level over 24 hours, that is the standard deviation, the mean amplitude of glycemic excursion, the MAGE, TIR, that is a percentage in target glucose level of 70 to 180, fasting, postprandial, area under the curve, that is when the blood glucose level is higher than 180 within three hours of meal, and AOC over the curve of our blood glucose level less than 70. Now, again, a CGM graph. If you look at this graph, this patient is having a, a, um, a hypoglycemia at around 3 a.m. And again, patient is had, uh, patient used to have a peak after breakfast, after lunch, and after dinner. And the after lunch peak was modified after um, uh, with the inclusion of a post meal walking, and which has uh, decreased the uh, peak. And we see that after the post dinner, there is another peak which can, we can modify the medications by giving um, medications at that time so that the peak is reduced. So with a CGM, we can properly manage a diabetic individual. So again, as I have already mentioned, that a picture speaks thousand words. So this is a picture showing the timing range and a CGM an ambulatory glucose profile. And what, if you talk about the guidelines, I'll just cut short. The target range for type 1 and type 2 individual is 70 to 180. For pregnant individuals, is 63 to 140. TIR target should be 70, as I have mentioned. But for elderly patients and patients at risk, it should be less than around 50%. Again, TIR has been associated with a, um, with a decreased risk of microalbuminuria if your TIR is um, under control. So 10% decrease in TIR increases the risk of retinopathy progression by 64% and incidence of microalbuminuria by 40%. And also the incidence of retinopathy decreases with an increase in TIR in all the ranges between mild, moderate NPDR and BTDR. Mission technique one. If you talk about the carotid intima media thickness as well, as TIR increases, the risk of abnormal CIMT also decreases. And as I mentioned before, there, there were two studies, one with Beck and the other by Matt Mohan. In Beck, it was on only on type 1 individuals, and uh, Matt Mohan had done it on type 1 and type 2. Um, in type 1, 70% TIR uh, correlated with 7% HbA1c, and a TIR of 70% uh, was around 6.7 uh, by Matt Mohan. So an increase of 10% in TIR corresponds to a decrease of approximately 05 to 0.8% of HP1s. So as I've already mentioned, it has got an increased mortality. Uh, glycemic variability has got an increased mortality, increased uh, incidences of retinopathy, microvascular complications, and nephropathy, increased cardiovascular death, and obviously there is increased amputation as well. Mainly, there is an increase in the hypoglycemic events as well, and cognitive, cognitive derangement is also there with a high, uh, large glycemic variability. So, the su survival rate decreases and the incidence of cardiovascular events increases with MAGE. As MAGE increases, the risk of microvascular and macrovascular complication increases with high variability of fasting, blood sugar, and the incidence of hypoglycemia increases with high glycemic variability. Glycemic variability indices like the standard deviation and the MAGE also increases with age. So we need to focus on elderly individuals. And there is a risk of apoptosis as well with an increase in um, glycemic variability. Risk of kidney failure, Alzheimer's disease also increases with glycemic variability. So glycemic variability must be managed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ipshita, for the for wonderfully presenting uh, important points so convincingly. Now, I think let's go to the uh, against the motion and Dr. Shubrutto Chakraborty will be speaking against the motion. Dr. Shubrutto. Thank you, respected chairperson for setting the context for today's discussion. Thank you, Biocon, for organizing this scientific discussion.
Yeah. So what was the context of this discussion? The glycemic variability management is essential today for proper management of diabetes. Now mark these words. We have included the words essential. We have included the words today. So we need to be backed up by both science as well as practicalities. Now, before coming to any conclusion, let us address these five questions that would make things easier and clearer. So are practical validated indices or markers available in this arena? Is there unequivocal evidence linking glycemic variability to poor outcome? Is evidence available at our disposal that minimizing the same would lead to improvement in outcome? Now, does knowledge about glycemic variability automatically lead to better decision making? And how practical it is to perform or advise performance of glycemic variability in routine clinical practice? Now, this is a comprehensive yet not exhaustive list of the glycemic variability indicators, most of it arising from the CGM data and some directly measurable from the serum. Now, these can be classified according to time or amplitude or according to short-term variability data or long-term variability data. Or according to this gentleman, Rodbert, they can be classified in four distinct types, uh, clubbing all these aspects, amplitude, timing, and other clinical characteristics. Now, this exhaustive list, multiple classifications have made things confusing and often intimidating. Especially if we understand that despite the various formulas offered, there is no clear consensus on the gold standard method for measuring glycemic variability in routine clinical practice. Not only this, the calculation involved behind developing these indices is complex and the interpretation is not so simple and straightforward. Not only this, this in, these parameters are plagued by multiple issues, such as it is difficult to assign any biological relevance to them since each of them was based on tracing some individuals with diabetes. And for some indices, there's no normal range available. So until and unless you have the normal range, how can you make an uh, informed decision? Now, standard deviation is probably the most used in this uh, index in a routine clinical practice but if in, it's not infallible because it simply assumes that glucose measures are normally distributed or follow a Gaussian pattern, which unfortunately is far from reality. Even mean amplitude of glycemic excursions has been criticized on multiple aspects, but most importantly, it's operator dependent. It depends on sampling frequency and there is ambiguity as to where and when peaks and nadirs begin and end. Even the serum-based markers such as 1,5-anhydroglucitol as a marker of glycemic variability, it works wonderfully well when the blood glucose is below 180 milligram per deciliter, but allow the A1C to shoot above 8%. It is plagued to multiple problems. So simply put, we do not have any validated markers, no gold standard, but have only a complex and confusing array of glycemic variability indices. So the impression is likely to be erroneous. And if the interpretation is erroneous, how can you consider it essential in a routine diabetes care? For glycemic variability to be useful in clinical practice, these parameters need to be easily obtained and easily interpretable, which unfortunately is not the scenario nowadays. Now, uh, coming to the next question, does glycemic variability uh, always lead to poor outcome? It's uncontrolled glycemic variability linked to poor um, uh, uh, or progression of micro and macrovascular complications. Now, Dr. Ghosh has shown us multiple data linking glycemic variability, the progression of micro and macrovascular complications. But is there something more that means there's something more to the story? Let us see. Now, most of these data came from small scale observational studies and few or no randomized controlled trials have been conducted in this regard. And in these trials, definitive evidence on hard clinical outcomes remains scarce. And as you can see, many of these studies have encompassed patients ranging in few of tens or hundreds. So their applicability to or their broad scale applicability to routine clinical practice is a subject of question. 
Now, many of these studies have not corrected the fallacies of the glycemic variability indices, which they have relied upon. So the reliability of their results in turn would be questionable. But far more important is the fact that there is an equal set of studies which have come up with an uh, diametrically opposite or surprisingly divergent results. Say, for example, these uh, DCCT sub-analysis where, where Kilpatrick et al. noted that blood glucose instability is never a predictor of microvascular complications, in particular retinopathy. Now, why single out uh, this DCCT subgroup analysis when we have multiple other studies which have equally failed to elucidate any relationship between glycemic variability and the development of retinopathy or nephropathy? Even for a moment, for the sake of discussion, if we agree that glycemic variability is linked to microvascular complications, one thing still remains clear that there is even lesser connection between glycemic variability and macrovascular complications. Now, isn't it something we already know from the HB1C trials that glucose burden is linearly linked towards the development of microvascular complications and to a lesser extent, the macrovascular complications. In fact, in the earlier presentation, you have already seen that HP1C has an inverse relationship with time in range. So the writing is clear on the wall. Information is not superior to that provided by H1C. And most of the data came from small scale observational studies where no hard clinical endpoints were not analyzed. And those studies suffered from methodological flaws and still came up with conflicting and contrasting results. With such an example, how can we incorporate glycemic variability as an intrinsic part of routine clinical care? So analogous to the vital role played by a one scene testing the glucose hypothesis is the need to establish an accurate and biologically relevant modality to test this glycemic variability hypothesis, which should cement the place of glycemic variability in routine clinical care. Now, what did we see in the earlier presentation? That it's the accumulation of oxidative stress which leads to poor outcome. Now, the caveat is that most of these findings again came from in vitro studies and animal studies. Studies in human beings are far lesser and when they're done, the results were not on expected lines. So let us exemplify this fact further. So it's a 24-hour urinary PGF2, which is commonly used as a surrogate marker of daily oxidative stress in clinical trials where oxidative stress is analyzed. Now, in an UK-based cohort, they noticed that high glycemic variability was noticed in children and adolescents attending a summer camp. But unfortunately, there was no correlations between glycemic variability and urinary PGF2. Similar other trials have also noticed or failed to delineate any relationship between glycemic variability and a rise in oxidative markers. Now, coming to the second part of this question, does improvement in glycemic variability automatically lead to improvement in outcomes? Again, the trials specifically analyzing this question are awfully less. So additional studies are warranted before we come to any conclusion. But whatever preliminary studies have been conducted, especially the interventional studies involving the antioxidants, so specifically to counteract the oxidative stress theory of the proponents of the glycemic variability, they have no, failed to again delineate any relationship between the usage of antioxidants with the improvement in any va uh, vascular marker damage, or simply put, antioxidant therapy did not reduce the vascular complications. Now, what are the treatment modalities which can help to improve the glycemic variability? So you can well notice from this slide, it's the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, drugs acting via the incretin pathway, that is DPP4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor analogs, ultra-long acting insulins, SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, wait a moment. Aren't these the same set of anti-diabetic molecules which are already known for a long time to offer a robust and durable glycemic control and all of this coming at minimal risks of hypoglycemia? So technically, they are already destined to have low long-term glycemic variability. So again, the knowledge about glycemic variability doesn't unravel any newer facets regarding these anti-diabetic molecules and does not help us in any way 
in better choice of anti-diabetic agents in our routine clinical practice. So simply put, it doesn't influence us in any way in the decision-making process in our routine clinical care. Now, move, uh, move aside science. So let's embrace practicalities. Now, how do we analyze or uh, um, perform glycemic variability in our routine clinical practice? We have either of two options, right? We have seven point uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose, but mind it, it's painful, cumbersome, requires high degree of patient cooperation, and it's financially draining. And simply put, it's not agreeable to majority of our patients we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. So what's the other way? So it's a performance of continuous glucose monitoring, possibly the talk of the day, the patients. But it, uh, we need to understand that although it negates many of the disadvantages of the self-monitoring of blood glucose, but it comes with itself a fresh problem. That is the issue of costs and reimbursement. And you can well understand the scale of this problem if you, under, if you uh, accept that even the Western patients find it difficult to have continuous glucose monitoring for two weeks or more, since coverage of continuous glucose monitoring by insurance companies is variable. And uh, so we can well extrapolate the scenario with Indian patients who are uh, regarding the affordability we have seen, it's quite difficult. Now, what about accessibility, right? This continuous glucose monitoring is, uh, this modality is mainly available for uh, uh, the patients hailing from the so, tier one cities, metropolitan areas, and no, not accessible to patients from rural background. Now, to put things into perspective, majority of the new onset of diabetics, the recent explosion in new onset of diabetics, come from the rural background. So, those patients who require this modality the most, these patients do not harness these advantages. So, either this modality is inconvenient to most of our patients or they're unaffordable or inaccessible. So probably there are only a few subpopulations where continuous glucose monitoring might be useful. So absolutely, you, uh, insulinopenic conditions like patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus or patients with repeated hypoglycemic episodes or uh, patients with hypoglycemia and awareness, pregnant diabetic patients or patients with brittle diabetes. But other than that, we need to understand that there are no practical validated markers currently available to analyze glycemic variability. So is there any unequivocal evidence linking glycemic variability to complications? And is evidence available at our disposal that minimizing the same leads to improved outcome? The answer is negative. The knowledge about glycemic variability doesn't always lead to better decision making. And it's never practical or realistically feasible that our patients would agree to performance of self-monitoring of blood glucose or uh, continuous glucose monitoring in routine clinical practice. So, uh, so the decision is pretty clear. For decades, the A1C level has been the dominant metric in assessing glycemic control, and it's used by physicians to evaluate treatment responses and optimize diabetes therapy and in clinical type 2 diabetes mellitus research. It's considered the primary outcome of efficacy and should remain as we speak in contemporary management of diabetes. We lack both the compelling evidence and the means to target glycemic variability separately as an independent clinical marker in routine treatment of diabetic patients. So time is not ripe to make a transition from glycemic triad to glycemic painted. We should uh, allow some more years, we should have some more data at our disposal before we can make such a transition. So the statement should come with a caveat that is barring a few clinical uh, scenarios, barring a few diabetic subpopulations, glycemic variability is considered essential in contemporary management of diabetes mellitus. Hope it settles the controversy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty. It was excellent. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, do you have any points to rebut? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, regarding decision taking, uh, regarding the uh, anti-diabetic drugs that we have, we prefer those drugs which has got lesser amount of hypoglycemic incidence 
and those drugs which actually act on the PP, like the glyptins, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors. We are, um, we are the Indians or the Asians have more amount of DPP-4 enzymes and we take lot and lot of carbohydrate rich meal and uh, um, alpha glucosidase uh, side is in, uh, inhibitors. All these drugs act on PP so that it doesn't cause an increase in the excursion, glycemic excursion, that is a postprandial excursion. And we choose drug which has got a low propensity to hypoglycemia. So we indirectly, we are treating glycemic variability. We are trying to have uh, uh, use drugs which has got low, uh, which improves the glycemic variability. So that is one that helps in decision taking, uh, decision making, first of all. Regarding evidence, this is something which is new and we need time to have good amount of evidence. But the evidence that we have favors the use of glycemic variability into the modern glucometrics into our daily uh, uh, daily uh, care. Uh, that the, the reason behind the evidence that he has talked about is in numbers uh, in tens and hundreds. The majority are in tens and hundreds because this is something new, but there are studies which included thousands. For instance, uh, the DCC, uh, DCCT trial that he was mentioning, the progression of micro, um, the, um, uh, the retinopathy, which is by 64%, and microalbuminemia, which is by 40%, they included individual, um, thousand individuals, little more than thousand individuals. And obviously, they had that uh, evidence that TIR helps in a decrease, a decrease in the progression of the microvascular complications. And indirectly, if we see that the major microvascular complications that we had in the previous STAR trials, that is in the intensive group in the ACCORD advance and the VADT trials, it is seen that with an adva in intensive therapy with an HB1C of less than 6.4 percent or around 6.4 percent, there is no major advantages or the incidence of uh, macrovascular complications like the death is more, possibly because hypoglycemia even some more. This is the thing that we see is with an HB1C of less than seven, the hypoglycemia incidence is more and the time in hypoglycemia is more. So we need to take those individuals and see whether they have the HB1C level in the lesser range as well as the glycemic variability in a lower range, like low glycemic variability with a lesser amount of hypoglycemia. So this helps in decision taking. And as I've already mentioned, because oh, it's cumbersome, it's impractical, yes, but 7 point SMBG that we say, one week 7 point SMBG every three months will suffice, at least for the time being. Later on, possibly we'll get a better um, a better um, machine or a better uh, needleless um, thing, uh, which machine which will help us and possibly a cheaper option, which will help us later on. But for individuals, as he has mentioned, Dr. Shubhrata has mentioned, that those with brittle diabetes, with those having high hypoglycemic unawareness, repeated episodes of hypoglycemia, uh, in pregnancy, those with type, uh, type 1 diabetes having uh, high fluctuation of blood sugar levels with uh, repeated episodes of decay, they need to be monitored with a CGM. Um, again, uh, he had mentioned that regarding the oxidative stress, the study that I mentioned, it was on uh, in, uh, umbilical endothelial cells. So actually it's human, something which is which has to do with human. And it's very difficult to perform experiments on human when the, with, uh, with uh, something which we have recently found out. So I'll say that it may not be essential for all of us because we come from a low and middle income country and where we cannot give a flow the SGLT2 inhibitor and DPP4 inhibitor to every individual. We still rely on uh, lifestyle management, metformin and uh, sulfonylureas and uh, insulin because because of our financial constraints. So we have to use this um, in few individuals, in, a, uh, in the susceptible individuals, but we need to use it and it is essential for them. Thank you. Thank you. So actually re rebuttal is uh, typically doesn't take place, but I think Dr. Chakraborty has noted a lot of points. So we would love to hear from him. <laughs> 
so dr ghosh has already partly agreed to what i mentioned in my concluding remark so performance of continuous glucose monitoring or embracing this glycemic variability indices in routine clinical care only caters to a certain group of individuals those individuals hailing from relatively affluent sections of the society but as i reiterate again the real explosion in new onset diabetes come from the rural backgrounds and until and unless we can make this modality available and accessible and affordable to these populations uh, even with a uh, lot of data scientific data even favorable data out of disposal doesn't mean anything so uh, da having data in the positive format doesn't mean anything if it doesn't transform the lives or the treatment care of patients we interact in our day to day clinical practice so what was the premise of this discussion is is essential today in the to contemporary diabetes management so possibly standing in the last quarter of 2021 we cannot say for sure whether it's essential in a routine clinical care of type 2 diabetes mellitus yes possibly yes for a some certain the diabetic sub populations it might be useful but again there are a lot of ifs and buts with the data we see were actually valid with the uh, subject to a lot of controversy whether the the studies which have done have actually included indices which were plagued by multiple issues whether they have included a significant number of patients how many of these studies have actually involved human studies so even if we embrace all the all these practicalities still we uh, possibly we have one unifying aspect from coming out from this discussion yes, standing in 2021 in contemporary diabetes mellitus it can never be considered indispensable over and above a1c never possibly it might be just another arm in i uh, in the fight against diabetes diabetes mellitus another armamentarium in the fight against diabetes mellitus but it can never be considered as something which cannot be done or we so thank you thank you dr chakravarti the debaters have been excellent i have nothing much to add but it is true that we have come a long way from measuring blood in sorry glucose in urine to the measuring the blood glucose to hba1c and further on uh, the reason we are having this debate is that it's true that uh, hba1 there are limitations with the uh, measures we are having today and we need to improve on what we have uh, oh, the that is the glycemic measures we have at the same time it is also so true that the measures of glycemic uh, this one variability have a lot of metrics we don't know which would be the best metric uh, we are flooded with data and information we'll have to use it in the right way we need more evidences of the effect of the glycemic variability heart outcomes of the effect of the glycemic variability on heart outcomes like the renal and everything uh, renal cardiovascular and others uh, yes we need to improve on the measures we are having today but the white scale applicability may not be possible at this time and this, this will evolve so we think like the data on glycemic variability will evolve and you are budding endocrinologists and i think in your time it will evolve all the more so thank you uh, everyone and back to professor shen gupta for his uh, comments yeah let me thank you uh, thanks indira for conducting the debate it is always challenging to conduct a debate and to both the persons who spoke for and against it was i think this has enriched us with knowledge Thanks, that's sir. the most important thing this is the interesting way to learn so thank you all also thanks to dr anirban sinha who i think has left the meeting by now and this was a festival webinar so we are all in the festive mode so let's enjoy our festivities and stay safe stay healthy enjoy your day, uh, puja holiday days till again we meet for some other some other program and i thank biocon and lakedown synergy once again for facilitation and for giving us the platform good night all of you good thank you sir good night thank you sir thank you thank you ma'am uh, thank you thank you good night